This afternoon's program on the black social economy boosting social enterprises, money pools, and cooperatives among Canadians. My name is Michelle Johnson, and I'm the director of the Harriet Tubman Institute. And so on behalf of our institute, I welcome you. This event has been put together by our amazing Dr. Caroline Hussain, uh, who is a research uh, associate with the Institute and a member of the Tubman Executive. Caroline has worked tirelessly to pull together the speakers for this afternoon, uh, Ms. Janet Skerritt, Dr. Jessica gordon Nemhard, who we will hear from later on. But I just wanted to uh, pray their indulgence to tell you a little bit about the Harriet Tubman Institute and then turn things over to Caroline who will run the show. She doesn't know that yet, but she'll run the show this afternoon. The Harriet Tubman Institute, which is on the third floor of York Lanes, is a place at York where if you're interested in issues to do with Africa or persons of African descent or anything to do with the African diaspora, that's where you come. Our full name, the Harriet Tubman Institute for Research on Africa and its Diasporas, tells you something about ourselves. We are an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary, uh, organized research unit, and this is our interest. Okay, so welcome, welcome, welcome um, to this event hosted by Tubman. And also, I should say, it's the Busso um, lecture. Um, the Black Social Economy Boosting Money Pools, Cooperatives, and Social Enterprises. I love it when my two worlds collide, which they seldom do. I'm uh, part of Tubman, it's like my family. And I also teach in the great program of Business and Society, which I have some students here. And by the way, those of you that are in Sonia's class, she's letting you stay till 4.10, so please hang around. Um, so I want to thank all of you for coming to this event. I should um, admit that, you know, and give credit to the students that I had in my placement course last year because they came up with a theme for the Canadian social economy looking at intersectionality. And it's something I write on and I talk about and it's an emerging area within this field of social economics. And it's the students last year that said, hey, why don't you ever organize something that has to do with racialized people in the social economy? And of course, you know, the bureaucracy of York scares me and how to get money and how to do all of this stuff. But I, you know, I had tons and tons of help with Chevy, um, who's the RA here, who's filming you. So if you don't want to be filmed, by the way, stay away from the camera and please sign a photo release sort of filming um, because we need your permission, okay? It's at the sign-in desk. But also the Business and Society Club have been tremendous and my colleagues and of course at Tubman, a lot of great people have assisted me. But today's Today's discussion is something that I feel very personal about. My family have always engaged in these informal uh, collectives, ROSCAs, we call them ROSCAs, Rotating Savings and Credit Associations. They're very much a part of the social economy landscape. No one gives them that kind of credit, okay? And we need to stop that and start giving some truth telling about these mutual aid societies, particularly in the West. And so this is why this discussion is so important today. Um, we have two really, uh, really two speakers that I, I greatly admire. Um, and I use the work of Jessica Gordon Nemhart. I think I know everything she's written. Um, and I use it because I can relate to it, I connect to it, it reinforces the work. And she's also been courageous in really turning the narrative around on what counts to be a part of the social economy. So that's why she's here today. She's going to talk from an African-American experience about collectives, cooperatives, mutual aid societies. She's been studying this stuff for a very long time. So we're lucky to have her in our midst. And not only is she just a scholar, but she's doing this stuff applied. She's going into communities and talking to our people to learn about collective organizing. And boy, do we need that today, right? Look at America. And now, just um, Janelle Skerritt is a you know she's just a phenomenal leader. I sent my placement students to her. She's been a community activist for decades. Just here on the ground, she gets the beat of the community every single day. She gets the struggle. You know, um, she was out until 4 a.m. last night. People think she's doing alternative things, but she's really dealing with crisis every single. 
single day. And she's here going to talk about these money pools. These money pools that are done in the West, in Canada. Right here among our diaspora people. So we don't have to go to exotic places to learn about what the social economy is doing for racialized people. We have two wonderful speakers here today. Uh, and in the order in which they're going to speak, I would like to introduce first Jessica gordon Nembhard, whose book, Collective Courage, A History of African-American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice, says a lot about her. As Caroline says, she is a practitioner as well as a scholar. She is a professor of community justice and social economic development at City University in New York. I think if there's a scholar who really represents what business and society would like to represent, it's she, I think. I can't think of anyone better who, uh, in theory and practice, is doing very much what we aspire to as well. Um, she is going to uh, talk on her book, Collective Courage, uh, with a different subtitle, Low African American Cooperatives and Solidarity Economics. So uh, Daryl's wish might actually come true that we get some uh, uh, material on cooperatives there. Um, thank you for coming, uh, Jessica. Um, my favorite touch in her biography is that she's the proud mother of two children and grandchildren. Uh, we academics often uh, don't acknowledge the people who uh, really make us who we are and are more important to our academic work than we often think. Very nice touch. Uh, I would like you to welcome her extremely warmly from New York, Jessica gordon Um so uh, thank you for having me. I probably have too much to say, so I may have to go a little fast at some point, but I'll try to cover everything I wanted to say. I do want to start with the original, uh, acknowledging the original occupants of the land, and also I always want to remember the struggles of enslaved laborers and those who continue to labor without just compensation. And I really acknowledge and stand on the shoulders of those who have look to liberation through cooperative ownership and cooperative economics. That's the book, and um, it is for sale out there, so I have to make my little pitch. Um, it was about a 15 to 20 year process, uh, mostly because when I started out, I didn't realize there was going to be so much information about African American cooperatives. It seemed like there wasn't much, and so I thought maybe I needed about two years to do it, and then I'd be done. Um, but I also, for those of you who are aspiring scholars, it also took me a while because um, I was a single mother of two children, as you heard, and trying to have a career. So writing a book in between all that um, is, is a struggle. But it came out, and luckily we've had a lot of good, um, good attention to it. So I'm really happy about that. So basically what I was looking at, I wanted to know if African Americans had a co-op tradition because um, when I started talking to African American communities about cooperatives in the United States, they mostly told me they didn't have a tradition. So that didn't sound right to me, and I started doing the research. I talked to some colleagues who had been doing some research, and I realized there was more to the eye. And so I started out with looking at uh, grassroots economic organizing, because cooperatives as a legal form really only start in the late 1800s. And I learned from W.E.B. Du Bois, who's another African-American scholar who some of you may have heard, heard of. He actually did a book on this in 1907. And he actually started with grassroots economic organizing and economic cooperation in, in all forms. And so what we're now calling the social economy and what I call the solidarity economy was really these early precursors to the official co-op businesses that came later. And what we learned from this history, or what I learned from this history, and I'm now talking to people about, is this long legacy of creating communities, enclaves, black businesses, other economic activity that could be insulated and isolated from racial discrimination and neglect. So if you remember, African Americans uh, were brought here involuntarily to be enslaved, didn't even own their own bodies. And so often, so they start out in the economy in the way, way bottom, right? And then even after slavery is ended, there's not a real ability to uh, take control of your own labor, own your own businesses, that kind of thing. And so they often participated in these other kinds of things, which I'll talk about, as a way um, to address that neglect, oppression, and discrimination. We even 
Du Bois said this, and I think a few other uh, blacks early on said the Underground Railroad was really also a solidarity economic system. If you think about all the pieces and all the resources that had to be put in place to bring, to get an escaped enslaved person from way down in Florida or Louisiana all the way up to Toronto or Ontario or somewhere in Canada, um, it takes a whole economic system of collaboration and most of the time clandestine. And that turns out to be a lot of the characteristics of a lot of the um, efforts that I found along the way. A lot of them were clandestine because otherwise they would be broken, destroyed, etc. And so partly this history turned out to be hidden, I think, because they had to be so clandestine and it was so dangerous to participate in these activities. We also know that um, what were called freemen, freedmen, but even enslaved peoples actually practiced uh, and use mutual aid societies. And um, in a minute, I'll tell you a little bit more about those. Oops. Forgot to take this slide out. But anyway, <laughs> this was just to show you that there were actually, from the 1880s, actually from the 1700s on, there were black organizations, sometimes the largest black organizations of their time that were actually interested in cooperative economics and solidarity economy activities. And that this is just a list of some of them. So first, what do I call a solidarity economy? I use the term solidarity instead of social economy because it also has this uh, political connotation of economies that are really about um, anti-discrimination, undoing the systemic oppressions of the current economy. So it's not just that it's informal, social ways to do economics, but it's very consciously ways to undo the dehumanizing that the mainstream economics does and to connect with humanizing ways to Go to people to work together, so grounded in these notions of solidarity and cooperation, promote social and economic democracy and equity, not just equality, right? Equity is a little bit more than equality. Um, along the dimensions, race, class, gender, sustainability, uh, both <coughs> human sustainability and ecological sustainability, and then this pure pluralistic, organic notion, that's sort of the grassroots, it really bubbles up. These are activities that bubble up from people who are living and trying to make a living and trying to reproduce themselves in a humane way. So I think I said all this already, it's a grassroots approach, diverse, shared values, shared commitment to process of transformation, um, and believing that the best solutions come from our collective knowledge. And then that building the road as we walk, so that these are innovation, innovative, often uh, no one thing is the same, even if it's all under the same rubric of a Rasta or whatever, a, a Susu or any like that, but they all look a little different because people are molding them to what they need. I don't know if you can see that, but that's the notion of the roots to the trunk to the branches of the tree, and so the trunk are that democracy, diversity, cooperation, equity, sustainability, right? The roots are the issues of rights and needs and invisible valuing, and then the branches are all the different kinds of activities we end up creating. And then another way to look at it is the circle, more of an economic way, the circle from creation, production to surplus, and all the different kinds of things between gifting and credit unions and fair trade and worker co-ops that all can fit under this model. And then what are cooperatives in particular? Hopefully you all know, but I'll give you a quick notion of that. Companies owned by the people <coughs> in the community who create them, who use their services or make their products, so member owners or worker owners. They're formed for a purpose, right? Not, not for profit. For profit is like the third mission of a co-op. Their purpose is to satisfy a need, provide quality goods and services for the people who came together to problem solve, um, and often is to provide things that the market isn't adequately providing. Sharing risk as well as sharing prosperity and, and surplus. <coughs> Democratically governed, that one person, one vote is really important because most economics is about how much money you put in, gives you how much veto power and how much vote. In a cooperative, it's your person, your membership, not how much you invest or put in to the co-op directly. And then there's seven principles, which I won't go through, but you can look them up, and a set of values around self-help and solidarity. 
consumer-owned, producer-owned, and worker-owned are the major three types, and then we have some hybrids. Sometimes we have worker and consumer-owned, consumer and producer-owned, etc. And the really, you can find cooperatives in all sectors of society. And every, I actually now can say honestly that every ethnic group, every population in the world, every era of time, people have used cooperative, some level of cooperative economics or economic cooperation. In fact, I think the very beginnings of economics were basically cooperative economics. Um, and that matters because at least in the United States, when you first talk about co-ops and cooperative economics, the referent is always Europe, as if it's a European thing and the Europeans invented it. And so actually to do this research and to do this book, I have to get around that mythology. Um, yes, the Europeans have a strong participation in the co-op movement and are the ones that started an international cooperative group called the International Cooperative Alliance and the seven principles are based on the five principles from the Rochdales in England but in terms of cooperative economics and the use of collectivity and solidarity economics in a cooperative way and cooperative ownership was not started necessarily in any one place, everybody, it's universal. <coughs> so examples from African American history. So the forced segregation and uh, discrimination against African Americans really made it imperative that they do something alternative. <coughs> and join together economically because of that exclusion, marginalization. Sometimes it was really just pure survival. <coughs> One of the things I was able to find through the history of the, through doing the research of the history was that it turned out it might have started for survival, but early on, a lot of black leaders came to realize that it wasn't just for survival, but it was for the betterment of the race, as we would say, um, and to provide independence and a and a strong uh, support system for doing political, civil, and human rights activity. So you'll see, um, I try to give you some examples of connections between doing these cooperatives and social enterprises in a way that then helps them to move forward to advocate for their rights. And that's where I also, why for the book it's practice and thought, because the thought ends up being very important to the practice as well as the practice becoming important to the thought, as most dialecticians know. Um, and Du Bois is also one of the ones who said in his early writings that it was voluntarily, that we often voluntarily segregated. So it wasn't just that we were forced to segregate, but often we would voluntarily segregate as a strategy, again, to be able to control our own workplaces, our own work rules, and to have some control over uh, an economic system that we really had no control over. So sometimes we, we said, okay, we're gonna stick together and, and create our own communes, create our own villages, create our own companies, et cetera, so we could have a chance to breathe a little bit and, and gain some prosperity on our own. So those maroon societies, also a lot of the early intentional communities were run by blacks into Canada, especially in Ontario connected with black independent schools and then black independent living um, communes that uh, were basically collective living, collective uh, work, and then schooling for the children. And so that self-help ideology obviously is a piece of this. We've got to do for ourselves. We've got to find alternative ways to do for ourselves. And that way we can design and manage these services in a culturally, racially, geographically sensitive ways. And so, as I said, we did that from the beginning. So I'm not going to read you this whole quote. I can make sure the PowerPoint gets at least to the students or actually the um, Tubman Center. I can make sure you get it also. Um, but basically, Du Bois is saying the spirit of revolt made us cooperate. We cooperated. We did things to rescue slaves. We did things to build up our communities. And then all those led to a kind of economic emancipation and formal cooperatives later on. So that's the same trajectory that I've used. So we start really with the mutual aid societies and beneficial societies. These are joint purchasing and marketing, revolving loan funds, sickness, widow and orphan death benefit groups. Basically, um, they started with uh, death benefits because particularly as enslaved peoples and then even when they were freed, um, it was hard to pay for a proper burial. 
and one of the dehumanizing things was to not carry about burial, but we know from African, most African cultures, burial is a huge important thing. So this way every family put in their dues monthly so that there was a pot of money so if anybody died in your family you could bury them in the way that your family wanted to and you would have the money. So that's the idea. Most of you have experienced that in some way or another and know something about it, but we've been able to um, actually document these kinds of things from very early on, pretty much the first days that African Americans were here on the soil of North America. And so they provide these vital welfare needs um, from clothing to shelter to burial to emotional substance. And this whole another sense of it is to look at it as a, as a system of community care. Black mutual aid societies were often religious, fraternal organizations, often connected to independent schools, usually very informal, but sometimes formalized and, and eventually become formalized into even mutual insurance companies and other kinds of co-ops. The second oldest mutual aid society, African American mutual aid society, is the Free Africa Society in Philadelphia, which also started the AME Church. So you can see again these connections of communities of care. And the other interesting point about the mutual aid societies, as well as I find in the cooperative movement itself, is that the role of black women is huge. Black women and mutual aids often develop their own mutual aid societies and ran them, and so black women's leadership developed from them. Some of the early co-ops that I found, the women leaders had actually been leaders of the mutual aid society, and then used that experience to, and turned over and became, started co-ops and became leaders in their co-ops. So I now want to give you a few examples because I'm probably running out of time already. Um, one of my favorite examples, the Kambahi River Colony, is, a, is a, not a formal cooperative because they, we didn't have co-op law at this time, 1863. Um, but it's, and it's not a formal, it wasn't a formal mutual aid society either, but you'll see they did um, cooperative agriculture and communal living. It's a colony, it's a, swath of land between at the Carolina border coastline between the Sea Islands of, of South Carolina and the mainland. It was a remote area that was actually liberated by Harriet Tubman, <laughs> which is another reason I wanted to tell you this story. Um, and actually that fact isn't in my book because I learned that afterwards. But Harriet Tubman was a scout in the Civil War and worked as a nurse in the Union Army. And they often sent her through the South ahead of the Union Army because if you don't know about her, she made, what was it, 300 trips or more? She's supposed to have saved 300. She saved 300 people. I think she made 19 or 20 trips or something. Anyway, she brought um, fugitives, helped them run away, and brought them first up to New York and Massachusetts and eventually to Canada when it wasn't safe to keep them in the U.S. at all. But so she knew south like the back of her hand because she traveled at night all those times and so she was a scout so one of the things she did was she scouted out the Kambahi River area went back and told the Union troops how to attack etc they attacked they ran out the Confederates and um, there's all this plantation land that's left open and free luckily um, General Sherman actually had a, pro a confiscation project where he allowed the blacks to take over the plantation lands of Confederates and to start farming it. But the other thing that happened in this colony was that the black men joined the Union Army. 1863 is actually the first time that the United States allows blacks to join the Union Army. The first two years of the war, blacks aren't allowed because they don't want blacks to have guns, right? So this after the Emancipation Proclamation, blacks are allowed to actually officially become soldiers in the Union Army, and all the Kambahi River men join the Union Army and go off to fight in uh, the Atlanta battle. The women are left, and they run uh, the farms as a commune collective. They remain self-sufficient until the end of the Civil War. They farm, and they do crafts, and um, they self-managed this whole swath of land, and that's called the Kambahi River Colony. Um, so I think I said all that already. Anyway, um, it also becomes the name, the Kambahi River Collective becomes the name of one of the first uh, black feminist groups out of Boston, 
because they want to reckon back to this history. Um, again, they're thinking more not so much about Harriet Tubman freeing the area, but more about the women working together and running these plantations by themselves for three years. Another really interesting example of the solidarity system that's, that's based around cooperatives was in North Carolina in the 1930s and 40s. Two black independent educational institutions established a set of cooperative networks. First, they were doing co-op farming with the parents of the children that went to their school. They start teaching cooperative economics in their schools. They do um, credit unions, buying clubs, and they also both realize there needs to be some kind of cooperative health insurance, health service program. So they work on that, and they end up doing a statewide federation of black co-op groups that then interfaces with, this, with the white statewide federation to do education and co-op development. Brick's Rural Life School is connected to uh, one of the missionary churches, and then Tyrell County Training School um, was a separate black independent school. As we said, Bricks had adult education, credit union, a co-op store, jointly owned farm equipment with the parents and a health program. They were able to raise half the cost of a full-time nurse, and they used that much money, they leveraged that to convince the state health department to cover the other half and provide them with a full-time nurse on the school's campus. So another interesting way that the co-op and the collective activity then allows them to leverage things to get public resources. Um, by the late 1940s, more than 75% of the families in the area of the school were actually members of the co-op in this, this co-op uh, society that they had created. For Tyrell County, they also had study groups studying cooperative economics. Uh, they started a credit union, they then had a co-op store, and then by 1941, they provided cooperative health services. Um, and this is their health program. You had up to $100 for hospitalization. You paid a dollar a year. There was a monthly assessment of 10 cents and then a 25 cent co-payment. This is 1941. So it might, it's a little bit high in terms of a dollar a year in the Great Depression, but on the other hand, it's pretty low for $100 of coverage, right? Um, and they also were gonna hire a doctor on their program. And then the other thing was the statewide coalition that they create actually is really incredible. They created manuals for how to develop co-ops and credit unions in the black community. And in 1936, there were three black credit unions and, the, and just these beginning co-ops. By 1948, there are 98 credit union, black credit unions in the state of North Carolina and 48 other co-ops because of their efforts. So I wanted to show you that because again, this, this holistic notion, right, of you start with your own community, the small little things your community needs, you build up your community level, and then you keep moving out regionally. Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, who some of you may know because they also have chapters up here in Canada, A. Philip Randolph, founder and leader, he worked with the Ladies Auxiliary to the Brotherhood, which are basically the wives and the maids in the union. Um, to promote cooperatives because they had this notion, they understood that it wasn't good enough for them to just have union, steady union jobs which kind of put them in the black middle class. They needed to figure out a way to bring the whole community, right, to keep resources. They wanted to spend their money within the rest of the community um, and keep money circulating in the black community. So they wanted to do credit unions, buying club, co-ops, etc. They never got to sort of worker ownership but they had this whole system still of, let's make sure we keep money circulating in our own communities. Their first credit union was actually in Montreal, Walker Credit Union, which was owned and run by the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. They also started a buying club in Chicago, and they had study groups and buying clubs all over the, the U.S. Freedom Quilting Bee, 1960, so you see we're rushing through the centuries here. <laughs> um, in the South, in Alabama, they're a founding member of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, which is now also called the Federation of Southern Cooperatives Land Assistance Fund. They're celebrating their 50th year. The, the, the FSC is 50th year. Freedom Quilting Bee kind of died for a while and is trying to resurrect right now. They're a sewing cooperative started with the wives of sharecropping families, the women, I should say, of sharecropping families. 
And what they found was, you know, sharecropping is basically debt peonage. For those of you who don't know, it's renting land, but you always start off in debt, and you never can really get free of it because the same landowner, plant, former plantation owner, is the one calculating all that you owe. And so they want, step, they want new, more income. They found out they could sell quilts that they make and get income. They make enough money to start a co-op to buy 23 acres of land to build a sewing plant. They also, because they were able to buy land, they're also to help, able to help other sharecroppers to get out of the sharecropping system because they, they'll rent without the debt peonage or some of the sharecroppers who get thrown off their property because they registered to vote or participate in the civil rights movement can then, um, they'll, they sold, sold some of their acres to them so they could farm on their own or help them to lease their land first. So now they're a community resource, right? A community asset. They're helping blacks to become independent, to fight for civil rights, but to have an economic base that doesn't depend on the white plantation block that's trying to stop them. And so at one point it was actually the largest employer with the, between all the programs it had in its small town. Um, but it's also, again, as I said, a part of this whole solidarity economy of health. And I'll end with the Ujima Women's Collective in Pittsburgh, which is about three years old now, three or four, no, sorry, 2007, oh, 10 years old now. <laughs> Gosh, I always think of it as fledgling. It started with 15 African-American women who were all sort of um, small uh, kiosks. They were, you know, having, selling their stuff in little kiosks in different places around town. Usually they would get together um, like just after Thanksgiving, just before Christmas to sell their stuff. They realized they could do better with um, a permanent marketplace. So they pooled their resources and bought a space and they each have a stall in the space and so now they have a permanent marketplace and they're doing green entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship development for women. Um, you can see their products here, handmade jewelry, body care, organic produce, vegan and vegetarian food, arts and crafts, etc. So they, um, I said this already, they got a stable marketplace, they provide a fair and consistent market to reach their customers, they've been able to increase revenues, reduce their costs, they're teaching women's entrepreneurship classes because they understand that traditional Economic and racial disparities mean that the black women really need to figure out how to own their own stuff, but with, within a solidarity system. So they provide that solidarity system as well as the training. And they also connect with their historical, cultural uniqueness as blacks in Pittsburgh. And the Hill District is a famous district part of Pittsburgh. Um, and their goal is to increase the net worth of black women in their community. So they're not just looking at income, but net worth, meaning they really want women to have business ownership and wealth. So then they can support their families and their communities. So summing up, commonalities, combining sort of a populism with labor organizing, civil rights, and alternative economics throughout the centuries, addressing needs and solving community problems through these alternative economic systems, establishing co-ops often to provide affordable goods and services, but also sometimes to share tools, to lend money, to share profits, to supply and support each other. Um, again, I'll skip through this, but this is showing the different kinds of challenges that the cooperatives in particular solve, but often sometimes um, it was broader and it was a solidarity economy system, not just, not necessarily a specific co-op. Education turns out to be essential. I don't know if you saw that theme through some of the examples. Get coming together, talking about what the problems were, having a study group, and then having that study group keep things moving and, and do all the research and information gathering that you need to actually start a business was what most of the groups did and how they started out. So that education, but also that sort of grassroots organizing, coming together, talking to each other, and then educating each other was really important. Um, and then public education to the community so the community knows what you're doing and is supportive. Because it turns out communities are really important in this the support from your community and engaging and connecting with your community. And then also on the education side, most of the co-ops I found um, were connected somehow to a black organization that helped to do co-op education or co-op development. Outreach, I think you got the idea there. I didn't talk much about youth co-ops, but there's 
lots of examples, really exciting examples about getting youth involved, not just on campuses, but in high school and even middle school, and how enhancing that is for them. The empowerment of women we talked about a little bit, and then providing both income and wealth to a variety of marginalized groups. There are challenges. One of the reasons it's called collective courage is because all the violence and sabotage throughout the centuries, um, and also sometimes financial challenges. But most of the time, the co-ops were able to overcome that back with the solidarity values and, and, right, and connecting and sharing and just pooling whatever people had, not just financial resources, but time, energy, enthusiasm, et cetera. And so I, uh, I'll end by saying that the co-op movement for African Americans was really part of what I would call the long civil rights movement, meaning all efforts from day one of trying to be liberated from colonialism and exploitation and racism. And it turns out that when you look at the history, the co-op movement is really side by side with any of the civil rights movements and organizations. And by the 20th century, almost any black leader that you can show me, I can show you they have a connection to the co-op movement. Either they started their first job as a co-op person, or they attended co-op meetings, or they realized that co-ops were an important strategy to economic and political liberation, et cetera. And really understanding that if we don't have economic justice and economic liberation, we can't have real social justice or even political liberation. And so I leave you with a question. Do the solidarity economics and cooperatives do they lead us to a new social order? Um, the hope is yes, and I think often through history, even though a lot of times we were just doing survival, we also saw that with a good strategy, we might actually be able to change the social order and create some liberation through this solidarity economic cooperative uh, effort. Thank you. Janelle, you'll be glad to know, is an example of there being life after York, because she is a graduate of this university. Um, she studied communications, and she said to me that um, she was basically allowed to do whatever she liked. So um, even business and society doesn't <laughs> offer you that opportunity, but uh, I don't think communication studies does either uh, anymore, at least. Um, Caroline, you described her as a phenomenal leader um, in your introduction. Um, and I see that you have won the Phenomenal Woman Award, which uh, I made me start thinking, is there such a thing as a Phenomenal Man Award? And I expect there isn't, Forget probably it. because there are very few, or if any, <laughs> phenomenal men in the world, if there ever were. Um, Caroline also mentioned you were up to 4 a.m. last night, and um, to come with us today and um, be uh, with us after some uh, emergency management and uh, things in your job is a real achievement. We are deeply indebted to you. Indebted as well because uh, Janelle's organization is one that accepts students from our placement program. Some of you will have been through that program which uh, Caroline teaches, our fourth year course, and without people like Janelle it simply could not exist. So uh, thank you again for that. Um, the title of Janelle's talk is A Circle Unbroken, a personal reflection on, of susus among black Canadians. Okay. A great deal of time in your talk acknowledging, and I wanted to start that way as well because I think that all of what I'm going to talk about is information that was passed on to me that allowed me to do some of the things that uh, we were able to do with the susus here in Canada. So I want to first acknowledge that and also to acknowledge the continuing struggle of the indigenous people here in Canada for their basic human rights and, and treaty rights to be respected. So in this time, that's where we stand. And, um, and it's shameful. It's shameful. So the title of my talk today is The Circle is Unbroken. And I chose that title based on a book that was written by Marimba Annie that is called The, the Circle Unbroken. And uh, he, or she, I think it's a woman, yes, she wrote about all of the things that we have retained despite the history, the very tumultuous history that I guess we're talking about a lot this month, right, in, of African Canadians. So I just wanted to let you know a little bit about who I am. I was born in Trinidad and Tobago in 1965, and I am... <laughs> 
And I emigrated to, oh yes, actually I'm gonna have to have someone do that for me because I oh, fell the other day and my arm is a mess. So it's gonna hurt if I do it myself anyway. Thank you, Carol. And I am acknowledging that I'm also a feminist and a pan-Africanist. And uh, in terms of my identity, I consider myself African, Canadian of Caribbean and African descent. So it's, all, it's, it's pretty complicated. <laughs> okay, and so I just wanted to also acknowledge that what I'm sharing with you today uh, is information I learned from my grandma and information that I listened in on and I didn't know what, quite what I was hearing when women would get together and cook together and talk about things that were going on in their lives and it was a very real experience for me so uh, I know so much appreciation has been given to uh, what I'm doing but I would say that I'm delighted that there's a name for this that is being recognized within the academic community. And I was taking careful notes about some of the things. I like solidarity economics because I think that really we, uh, we need to think about these things at an elevated level. But for me, I first saw my grandmother as that woman. She was uh, widowed in her 30s, the mother of five that she raised essentially on her own, but doing the very things that that Jessica was talking about. She ran a couple of businesses, but not by herself. And she taught me to cook. And in addition, she always said, leave enough in your pot for someone who might be coming. So we didn't have much, but we always lived cooperatively. We always lived with the expectation that someone might come by. Now the Susu concept is exactly the same. It is about expressing the need of the community and in particular, it's about expressing a way to get out of some very difficult and complex situations that we faced as a community. So I listened in as a child, and uh, when we decided that we would come here to pursue the Canadian dream of playing hockey, which my brother did, I did not. Oh, well, ball hockey a little when I was younger. And uh, we, we came with an idea that Canada had so much opportunity for education and for all of these things. But there were barriers, there were restrictions to that that we didn't really know about because we weren't really told about <laughs> from the other side. From the other side, it's the land of milk and honey. It's the place where everything is gonna flow nicely. And I, I think in my work today as the executive director at Warden Woods, I can say that that's a common a narrative that I hear from many of the immigrants uh, who are newer than we were. So when they met these restrictions, they met these barriers, they met these challenges here that were unexpected, they had to be creative. And they didn't have to look far because they could rely on those traditions. So they formed these susu groups, these money pools. And, and my experience of it was that the group of women would get together, they would cook, they would talk, they would talk about things that they wanted to do. So again, the needs. It was based on not only the need, but on that building of a community of support. In the traditional susu, there would be a banker who would collect the money, usually cash, that all of the women contributed. So if you could imagine, a circle of 10, 20, 30 women, all putting whatever they could into a pool to build a, a mass of cash. And in, it's done di different ways. Uh, so I, I did it uh, as a, an adult myself, and I'll tell you how we kind of transformed it a little bit. But the banker usually held that, and the banker also made the decisions as to what was the most important priority at any given time. Okay? Yes. So it, uh, it, it was done in such a way that when the money was pooled together, the women would talk about their need and the banker would decide, okay, this month it's going to you or this period it's going to go to you. But as uh, there's other ways to do it too where exactly what you put in is exactly what you get. 
So that's how we did it when, he organized, when I organized the SUSU. And how we changed it was what we used checks to exchange the SUSU and eventually email transfers, which is something that my grandmother wasn't really into. <laughs> so these were the ways that we, we exchanged the money and so forth. So does everyone understand how the SUSU works now that I've kind of explained it out? Okay. So I, I'm not sure which slide you're on. Okay, good. So uh, what, it, what is SUSU economics all about for me? Well, it is about the economic system, but it's also about the eldership system on which it was based. Uh, uh, and it was based also on need and support, not on profit. So I think one of the other speakers spoke a little bit about that and about the fact that um, the, the, the profit motive is a very important part of doing business usually. Well, not necessarily in these businesses, and certainly not in the nonprofit sector in which I work. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, the SUSU itself, it, as a system, relates to the approach that I take as the leader in a nonprofit organization. The SUSU was also about community achievement, because it was about what we could do as a collective together. It was about agency and self-determination. And actually, there, there are some penalties. It wasn't all roses and sunshine. Because when you are getting together as a group of women in this community of support, your reputation is on the line if you renege on your deal with the SUSU. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Also, uh, I found that there is an international collection, connection. So even though the, the experience was very personal for me, as I started looking at this, I realized that all over the world, people were doing this. And, and one thing that they also had in common, aside from the community need and the community collective support, was it was mostly women. Mostly women who were pulling these things together. Okay, so next one. So the, I started to see the deeper connection as I looked at this between what I do uh, working within community and working in the nonprofit sector. And I, I started hearing uh, things like community economic development, community resilience, asset-based approaches, informal networks of support and collaboration. And for me, I was a person seeking connections to my ancestral roots as a woman of African descent. And so <coughs> I drew immediately some of the lines between these concepts that were being talked about and my own traditions and my own understanding and my memories of what I heard listening in on conversations with my grandma and my mom. So I, thought, I think there is a lot of potential for Susu. So my answer to your question is yes. I think there is a great deal of potential for models like this to be uh, about change and liberation and transformation in how we think about economics. So for a short while I worked with UNICEF and that's where I saw that this was also happening on a larger scale and that people talked about things like microloans and, and so on. The next one, yeah. So uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about Wardenwood's Community Center. So the Community Center is located in Southwest Scarborough. And in a nutshell, our mission is about poverty reduction. And also, we deal with a lot of immigrants and newcomers. So some of these concepts that I'm talking about, I'm not having to teach them. They, they, many of the people in, in the community come understanding collective work, Collective, collective economics and cooperatives and so forth. So one, one group that uh, Caroline has come to visit and talk with about the Susus is the Irie group. And this is a group of grandmothers from uh, West Indian countries, from Caribbean countries, who come together on a weekly basis. And a funny thing happened uh, just about the time that I started. The, the funding that we got to have this group ended. 
But this group continued, and they did it by, instead of us providing the meal, they cooked for each other. We provided the space, and they did everything else. They raised money, they held fundraisers, they threw a susu, <laughs> so that it financed the trips and things that they wanted to do. So I think it stood for me as an example where right in our midst, people are, are finding ways to do these things and to get around some of the barriers. So I think there's hope for the sector if we learn to do things like that. Um, we also have a couple of other things uh, that are very familiar to, to the whole uh, social economy <coughs> or solidarity economy. When I looked at the sector, we did a lot of work with employment. And I, I used to sort of, okay, used to call it the, uh, the car wash approach. You know, you put people in, they're kind of all messy, and they come out shiny on the other end after you fix them with some programs. And uh, that, to me, was not all that we should be doing. We should be looking at ways in which, if we truly are looking at asset-based approaches, then we need to be looking at what people bring to the table already, what they know already, and how do we incorporate that into their liberation. And also, it has to be about economic development and economic uh, liberation beyond pre preparation for employment. So things like entrepreneurship, and I, I have one small story. A young man came to me and uh, said that he had just finished training for uh, construction work, but, and he got a job, supposed to start Monday, but what he needed was uh, steel-toed boots, and they cost $150, which, because he wasn't working, he didn't have. So we invented something called the micro-microloan program, so it's even smaller than a $5,000 microloan, and it is for things like that. I just need a bus pass in order to get to work that first day. I need an outfit, I need shoes, whatever it might be. So that's the micro micro loan. And now it's rolled into our, mac, our, our micro loan program, which is not really a macro loan, but a micro loan program. So it's any, anything from 50 to $5,000 that people may need, and it could be for starting a business or just I need to find a way to get to work. So it is, uh, it is a, an important addition to the programming that we do. And we also support that with a business club that sounds a lot like the groups that you're talking about, where we come together and provide support to people who want to develop a business. And it's not just money. They get support to develop their business plan and so on. And the two students who are working with us this year in business, from, from Caroline's class, one is here in a New York hat. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, have been helping us with how to market and outreach to get that program really hopping. Okay, so the next one. I also do a lot of work, uh, uh, not a lot of work internationally, but some work internationally, and right now I'm working on a, a Ghana girls project, and uh, this project brings together girls on the ground in Ghana with elders on the ground in Ghana, and we raise money here so we've uh, explored things like susu pools, and also uh, right now we have a $300 challenge, and in March we are having a, uh, a donation uh, for, of hygiene product, a donation drive for hygiene projects, products. Because this project started by doing some research on what the girls in those communities needed and what were the issues that they were facing. And many times in their families, they're the last to be considered for an investment in education. So we also just started raising money for scholarships. So that part of it, uh, the fundraising part and the raising of the actual physical hygiene products that we ship down, and they have to be shipped in May to arrive in August. Unbelievable. Ghana's pretty far. <laughs> and it goes by boat. And we, uh, we also do trips, and I went on a trip to celebrate one of my milestone birthdays, and, uh, and met the girls, and there, there's me in the picture of over here. There I am. <laughs> <laughs> sitting with them and uh, learning really from them and, and sharing information with them about reproductive health and education. Next one. Oh, so this is uh, just more 
the, the picture here of the, the girl catching uh, water, she would catch, that's a lot of water to carry on your head. Could you imagine? Anyway, I thought um, you'd like to see a few of the pictures of, um, of what it looks like on the ground. And the, the picture in the front here, this is the crew on the Canada side that did the fundraising to get the trip going. So that trip goes every August, and if you want to go, let me know. Yeah? <laughs> working in the community. Uh, my husband and I own a farm called the Adinkra Farm, and it is a cooperative experiment. So we carry uh, most of the, we, we live there, so we are paying the mortgage there. But beyond that, we offer uh, camps. So you can look at, you can go to the next slide. We offer uh, camps, women's retreats, and uh, a opportunity for people to come and plant on the land. And uh, it is uh, a cooperative in the true sense because I'll give you just uh, one example with the camps, for example, how they started out. One March break, uh, we mothers were, how do we do this? How do we work and take care of our children? Some of us were single mothers, I was not, but we couldn't figure out, you know, what to do when it costs $600 in some cases to send your child to camp, nobody really had that lying around. So we all decided that we would just take two days each off of work and take each other's kids in the minivan and do what we could do for free <laughs> uh, around the community or take them on the TTC. So we did that and we, uh, we went to the malls and we saw Dora the Explorer, that's how long, long ago it was because <laughs> my child is now 16, he does not like Dora anymore. And, uh, and we, we, we took them to Ikea and, and put them in that big ball thing and they jumped around because it's free, 45 minutes of childcare, you know. <laughs> and then very, very inexpensive lunch. So we, <laughs> so we did that and then we called upon some of our resources. So my husband has a cousin who teaches piano lessons. She came and she did a piano lesson with them and they were jumping around the living room having a great time. And then we had someone else come and just uh, do a, a storytelling and Simon Says with them and so forth. So that's how it all started. It was parents and just community members coming together and contributing to give these kids a great experience. That has expanded now that we live in Simcoe County and the kids come up from Monday and they go back on Friday and they stay with us overnight. And the parents, well we started kind of with parents pooling and buying the groceries to feed them. But eventually, you know, I would say, okay, you're responsible for four slabs of cheese. You get some uh, chicken and you get the, uh, the T TVP. And invariably parents would go, oh, you know, I only was able to get two slabs of cheese. So then I, it ended up costing me money because I had to go to the store and buy more of the supplies. So then we started to charge uh, money or pool money together to do it. And now we're looking at a model where we would have a, throw a susu to raise money to help some of the parents who can't afford the fee. But we still keep the fee to about 250 for the week which for an overnight camp, which is amazing because it costs about 600 to $1,000 for other ones. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's the last slide. We, we also had a family come and put up a, uh, a wagon on the property this year and plant their own uh, food produce and so on. So we're truly looking at making it a community cooperative. So I want to thank you so much for listening today. And